Well, thank you guys yeah. so much for agreeing to to do this. This is uh <laughs> This is pretty, it's a pretty wild series of events that got us here just all the way through Reddit. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is bizarre. Yeah, so. I guess to just give the people that'll be listening uh, a little bit of background, um, I posted uh, the stand-up set about molestation on Reddit, and uh, for people that haven't used Reddit, they have little subreddits, uh, which are like subcategories on the website for things like molestation. Uh, and abuse and things like that and if you haven't checked it out I would really recommend it because it's like small little communities for people that have been through things like this to sort of chat anonymously about um, their experiences and uh, I was unaware about it until my friend introduced me to it and then I posted the set online there and got a, a really amazing uh, amount of feedback from people uh, like mm -hmm. like Annie and uh, just a whole bunch of people from across the country uh, who have been molested or abused or, or whatever it is that they've been through. And uh, it was really encouraging to have that happen. And I'm so glad that uh, Annie, you reached out and uh, you shared shared your story with me over Reddit. And I thought it would just be cool to to hear it again. And for the people that are listening to to know that like we said when we were talking that we're not alone and there's so many people yeah. that have been through things like this and yeah, unfortunately sure. it's such a it's such a topic that gets brushed under the rug because of how hard it is for people to to talk about it so um yeah that's sort of what we're going for with the podcast and uh, i'm really happy to have both of you guys on this call so i guess maybe just off the top uh, if you want to fill fill people in on who you guys are Sure. Um, so my name's Annie. I was the one who responded to the Reddit post. Um, I, I'm in Texas, Central, like Bible Belt, America. Um, I'm actually a licensed clinical social worker, and I deal a lot in trauma. It's not, it's not a coincidence, um, because I also experienced some childhood trauma. Um, but I just really felt compelled to respond to your post, Sebastian, because I think like the honesty and the sort of destigmatization of the experience and bringing, bringing light to the dark places and sort of like voice to where there is usually a lot of silence is really powerful. And so that kind of what prompted me to, to like, just get connected with you. So absolutely and it's it's so encouraging to hear that from you know a, a stranger and and other strangers across the internet and it's like i really i really hope that we can kind of get this stuff out to to more people because it's been pretty much everybody who's seen it who whether or not they were abused has had some sort of a gut reaction to it and i think it when you're willing to share the things that have happened to you it makes everybody feel a little bit more liberated from whatever it is that they've gone through uh regardless of whether or not it's abuse so yeah it's it's uh it's really encouraging and i'm so glad you reached out and and then you mentioned lauren when we were talking uh over mm -hmm. reddit yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, my name is Lauren Bino. Um, I'm uh, a writer and comedian as well. I really enjoyed your set. Annie played it for me. Um, Thank you. And um, Annie and I met in Chicago. I live in New York now. Um, I try to visit relative fairly frequently, but um, we met in Chicago when we were both working as crisis workers in mental health before she became a clinical social worker in our early 20s. Um, so this is over 10 years ago. Um, and we we became close friends that way, and that was really before um, sort of you went through this journey of sort of realizing yeah. certain things that happened to you. Um, and so I've been sort of there in that process, and then also just you know um, as a person in this world and interacting with other people who've been through certain similar things. And it just I also I think it's I I write a lot about. Uh, mental health and psychology um, for for men's publications. Um, like, um, so I do a lot of like work with men, and I think a big part of like the sort of response to the like Me Too movement stuff and um, has been a lot of like, yes, men are victims too, and there's like a lot of anger sometimes from s some people about their stories not being heard, but there's also not really a willingness to share those stories. It's like a lot of like, oh, men are victims too, like, and it's, it's like sort of the subtext sometimes feels like shut up about your trauma, like women, because uh, we have stuff too, but um, for men to sort of take a step back 
and actually share what happened to them and have conversations about it, I think is super important. So I'm very on board with what you're doing. Yeah, I, I'm glad you are. I think I think that there's there's a tendency with um, with the Me Too movement for people, I think just guys in general to be like, oh, come on, like, it's not all of us. Right. Like that's yeah. like just the, the natural urge is like, um, you know, I didn't do anything wrong or, or, or whatever it is. But I, I really think that in order to make progress with this kind of stuff, I think everyone needs to be involved in the discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not the, the right way to do that for sure is not shutting it down and just being like, I'm not the bad guy here. These are other people doing yeah. this. It's like we need to all be involved and all because I mean, it's it's also new. You know, like Mm -hmm. this type of stuff has been going on since the beginning of time. And now for the first time ever, basically, people are starting to talk about it and and realize that this is like an epidemic that we're dealing with on all ends of the spectrum. Um, So I think just opening it up and and sharing people's stories and letting everybody know that uh, that you're not alone. And uh, it's it's so helpful as a victim. And uh, and I just know that people who have been through things, a lot of people like like you said earlier, uh, Annie, like, a lot of the time, you don't even really know, you don't even really register that like, what you went through was abuse or the 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 uh, the level to which it was abuse. I mean, it's all there's just no education on this. Stuff. Like there's no people just don't know. I remember when I was getting molested, I didn't know what molestation was. So like mm-hmm. I can't even I can't even express what it is that I'm feeling upset about. And that's one of the things that I talked about in the first episode of the podcast is like uh, the only way that I was able to actually tell my parents was my mom basically asking me questions over and over again that got more mm-hmm. and more specific to the point where she was like, OK, did this guy touch you? Uh, yeah. And as a child, you just have no idea how to articulate these yeah. feelings and emotions. And I mean, it's just like we're not even going through puberty yet. Like, I don't know how to express this. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I'm 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 really glad that you guys are on board for all of this. And uh, I think that I think that we can really help some people. And if nothing else, it, it's helpful for us to just be talking to somebody else about it. So it's yeah. very therapeutic and cathartic and uh yeah, I think that it's awesome that you're here too, Lauren. And uh, and I know that comedy is really a magical thing uh, when it comes yeah. to dealing with not just trauma, but whatever it is um, yeah. that you've gone through. It's a really cool way to, to process things. And before I started doing comedy about getting molested, uh, I hadn't talked about it since um, I had to go, since the trial, basically, which was when I was 10. Um, and going from that and then, being able to laugh about it, it gives you this sort of like, it's sort of like a superpower. Like, it's like, oh, if I can laugh about this, then I have no issue yeah. talking about it. So I think it's, I think it's cool. It's awesome that you're a comedian and uh, I, I, I'm glad that you're here. And I think it's just, uh, yeah. yeah. And Annie, I know that you, you wrote me a very detailed uh, description of, of your, of your story over Reddit. Um, and as much as you would feel comfortable sharing, I would love to hear uh all of it. Yeah, sure. So it's interesting. I think I, I watched um, the majority of your first podcast and I was commenting to Lauren before, you know, we got on this call that um, you were able to describe your, you were able to recount your experience in pretty great detail, uh-huh. um, which is not something that I can do. And it's interesting. Um, so it's, it, so my, my story is really my family's story, um, and it's rooted in this intergenerational trauma. Um, and I was seven years old when everything sort of came out. Um, my, my mother's youngest sister's oldest daughter, who she had when she was 16, my aunt, my aunt had my cousin when she was 16, and my cousin was raised by my grandparents. My grandparents are the abusers in this scenario. Um, the scenario, my experience, <laughs> our family's history. Um, and she had engaged as an adult and a young adult in sort of like abusive um, relationships with her romantic partners and had to leave uh, Georgia, where, where all of this sort of began. My mother grew up in Georgia. My grandparents uh, lived in Georgia very small town um, outside of Atlanta. 
And my sister, my sorry, my cousin had to come here and live with us in West Texas to get away from her abusive uh, boyfriend. And as soon as she got some space, she basically was like, this is, this is still happening. My, my grandfather is abu- has abused me my whole life, is abusing my cousins. He still has access to them. Something has to be done. Um, so she made the phone call to her mother and my aunt. And my aunt asked my cousin, who's my age, tell me the things. Um, and it kind of just cascaded from there of cousins who were my age, who were born to my aunts later than my oldest cousin, um, coming out and describing, describing the abuse. And now everyone lived in, in North Atlanta, basically at the time, and we were very separate. And so I remember the conversation that my, my parents had with me, each of them separately, um, again, in contrast to your experience with your mom asking you more specific questions, my parents asked me, Papa never did anything bad to you, did he? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I was sort of paint. I remember sort of really early on being painted in this corner of just like, you, this is not something we talk about, think mm-hmm. about, feel, acknowledge. If it happened, doesn't matter, just put it away. Um, so... I sort of grew, and then, and so that happened when I was seven. So all of the exposure, all of my exposure to the sexual abuse stopped because my cousins had come forward. CPS had gotten involved when my aunt had taken my cousin to a counselor. There were criminal charges filed against my grandparents. Um, and and so that would like sort of split our family at that point, as especially that that generational split from my aunts and my mother from my grandparents. Um, so so that's when my exposure stopped. So from seven to whenever I have sort of like a happy, normal Bible belt, like good this ever family yeah. values mm-hmm. sort of like um, childhood experience. Um, so I really wasn't even aware that I had been sexually abused until much, much later. I would say, um, my daughter was like a year and a half, 18 months old. Um, and Lauren and I were talking about, it's interesting what, what kind of events or circumstances or environments link your brain to this realization Mm -hmm. that like, oh shit, this is, this is, this is a thing. This is a thing. And I don't know how to deal with it. And I've never thought about it. And it's my past, but now it's a bad dream. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's coming Mm -hmm. up and it's real and I have to acknowledge it and sort of redefine my relationship to who I am and what's happened and how that has impacted me. Um, and then the story there is my sister who's, who's older than I am. She's eight years older than I am. Um, growing up in our, you know, Bible Belt Christian family home, had been saving herself for marriage. So was 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 a virgin until she was not, but that was later in her <laughs> life. Um, and at some point in her late thirties, she's like, "I'm, I don't know that this is a thing," you know, because because the sexual abuse had created barriers to intimacy. So she never had a relationship. She never got married. Um, and then she's like, you know, I'm kind of questioning this whole, like, what am I doing? Everybody else has done this. Exactly. Yeah. And what if I never get married? What if I never get married? Yeah. I'm going to try it out. And she did. And almost immediately was flooded with memories. It was like the physical, um, sensation triggered a ton of memories for her. Um, so she went into therapy, was really honest with me about her experience and sort of that coinciding after the birth of my child and recognizing like, oh my gosh, that's a tiny little vulnerable female body. What are people doing to it? The answer is nothing because I'm protecting her, Mm -hmm. but the fears triggered in me and like, um, some of like the doubts and suspicions kind of made me think like, maybe this is, maybe this is a thing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting to, to sort of like go back and uncover that now as an adult and and recognizing all of the the impacts down down the line over the past geez how many years no it's crazy i think like i because this has happened to a lot of people i know where they don't realize it until later in life and like because something triggers it and it's like it's almost like no one can really say if they have ever been sexually abused as a child or they've never been sexually abused as a child for sure because their brains are such like yeah 
gnarly things that can sort of just open and close these doors if something is too much Mm -hmm. and you know other things have to reopen it so I mean it's almost like it would probably normalize all this a lot more if everyone kind of assumed that it was like possible I know it sounds fucked up but like we don't want to do that of course of course not no one wants to yeah. yeah but yeah, you know, but, what I mean? and, and I think I think Sebastian, you touched on this in your your video, your podcast about like how how traumatic memories are very tricky. Yeah, um, and you can't recall, or it was the Michael Jackson one. Yeah, and like there, like it is not like time and space become irrelevant. Um, and you're just left with sort of like this biochemical impression of reality, and it's not about where, when, who, what, why, and how. Um. And, and especially, yeah. and that's what's, it's, it's really, um, it's sort of sad and frustrating to see uh, the reaction that people have had to Michael Jackson. I mean, it's understandable because he was, you know, the biggest pop icon of the world. I mean, this is somebody's, this is people's hero. Uh, yeah. and, and nobody wants their hero to be a child molester. But it's, it's tough from the perspective of victims to be like, okay, uh, not only is it so difficult to come forward and tell your story but you might have people just attacking you and ridiculing you yeah. and, and the things that they point out it's like the main point that they make is that uh james safechuck said that he was abused in the neverland train station uh at yeah. whatever year yes, but then yeah. it wasn't actually finished being built until the following year and so people are like ah we got gotcha. you and it's like okay yeah. this, this dude's been remembering seven years of abuse and it's so difficult. But I, I also understand from the perspective of people that aren't familiar with this stuff. It's like, well, how can you not remember everything that happened? Which is such a mm-hmm. mentality of somebody who clearly hasn't been abused. Um, yeah. For me, and I touched on this in the first episode of the podcast, I, um, I didn't even remember the first, basically, I think it was a year, almost a year and a half of grooming uh, that happened. All I really remembered was the actual like physical uh, touching abuse that was like, Mm -hmm. that's what like snapped my memory. I was like, okay, this is going to be hard to, I'm not going to be able to forget this, but I forgot about the whole first half of it, all of the intro stuff. And it's just our our brains, like you said, Lauren, it's like, I think, I guess part of it is defense. It's a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. Our brains don't want to deal with this. Um, yeah. and, and then when, when something happens that triggers the memories to come back, it's, it, they just rush back in and it can be so overwhelming. And that's yeah. what happened to me during my testimony is, uh, yeah. I, I, when the, when the attorney, cause I had told one of my friends about the grooming and, and what was going on. And of course he told the, he told the prosecutor and everybody. And then the, then the defense attorney asked me, he was like, so Sebastian, like, what about, uh, the wiggle game, which was uh, like the grooming phase initially, what what the guy used as an intro to the actual molestation. And then mm-hmm. I remembered all of this. So it's like on top of, you know, being in the room with the guy and being 10 years old on this jury stand for however many, for four hours. Now I'm like remembering a year and a half of all these memories. It was just so overwhelming. And Absolutely. it's it's unfortunate that that's the state of our legal system is like we put kids in this environment that couldn't be less conducive to uh, you know i guess not telling the truth but being comfortable enough to express what it is that's happened to you um so that was one of the one of the things that i that i that i really think does need to change is like we 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 need to have a different way for kids to explain their stories that isn't in a court with a hundred (laughs) people so yeah I think even with sort of expert expert testimony, when they pull you know like neurologists and like neuropsychologists in there, like the whole the whole sort of like rep- repressed memory bullshit of the 1990s and how yes. controversial that was and yeah, and, and memories you know, and all that. Like, that's not a thing. And so there's this guy. Um, have you read the book um, "The Body Keeps the Score" or have you heard of it? No. What is it? Uh, it is a book about uh, trauma, and it is by this. Mm, I'm just going to be blanket here, like a uh, Scandinavian, mm-hmm. I think, um, mm-hmm. author. His name is uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. And he speaks um, a lot about like the, the neural um, neuropsychology of like specifically even like the, the chemistry of where 
like cortisol levels and um, stuff going on in your hypothalamus and your amygdala and how traumatic memories are formed and um, like your stress levels and how they all impact each other and how traumatic memories are recalled and um, how they get reactivated. And he does, a, he has a lot of research with like the functional MRIs being able to like um, person calling, recalling chronic trauma or someone with a traumatic history versus someone who's had a single episode of trauma, like a car accident and how it, our brain chemistry changes and our cellular like biology changes. Um, and how to, he provides like several examples of different modalities of, um, of trauma recovery work, but they all include the body. And it's like comedy would absolutely be one of them. Act, acting is another, yoga is another, EMDR is one, like neurofeedback is one, but it's not, it's not like just talk therapy. Like you have to get your body involved because that's where trauma is stored. It's in our body. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, so. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the, one of the things that, that would be so great to be, to be, pouring money into research wise and 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 looking at uh, looking at possible solutions to this uh recovery triggers whatever it may be i mean i remember i had this massive back spasm right before i told my parents we were driving back from california we'd been taken we just took like a family vacation there and uh mm -hmm. on the way back like my back was just i mean like screaming in pain agony and i had no none of us had any idea i didn't hit my back or anything but that was just, I guess, my body manifesting this stress and trauma and guilt and all of these emotions that were not being expressed. So, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to check that book out. Yeah, it's good. And I also wanted to, to sort of ask you a little bit more about um, the dynamic of because I think I think that is is actually a pretty common uh, experience is people, especially when it's family members. I mean, that's uh -huh. like a whole nother level of complexity where people yeah. don't, nobody wants, just in the same way that nobody wants Michael Jackson, their idol to be a pedophile, yeah. nobody wants Absolutely. their grandparents to be pedophiles. Yeah, that's, yeah. for sure. And, and that, that's what comes down, you know, so it's interesting, my mom, so so ob very obviously, like my, my grandfather was a perpetrator. He was almost indiscriminately a perpetrator when... When the claims of abuse came out and they were criminally charged, it sort of like divided their small town community. He was he was an upstanding member of the community. He was like a you know huge donor to the Methodist Church. He like ran a bunch of I don't know I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna be accurate here, but like Elks Club stuff. Um, and and people didn't want to believe it because he's a good guy. Um, and alongside that narrative there was one and my my aunt was really my aunt whose child she took to counseling um with the same aunt whose child came and visited us she was just like a crusader she was fantastic in, in advocating and standing up for her and going through the process keeping records she's like the historian she's kept all the records she's kept the newspaper clippings she's kept the court testimonies she's kept the everything um, and so alongside the narrative of he's an outstanding citizen, like several members of the community came forward and said horrendous things like he babysat my kids while like, and then paid my rent for me. Um, and that was like part of the part of like, he took advantage of like the lower people, people, the more vulnerable, the lower resourced, less resourced members of the community so that he could have access to the whatever he wanted. Um, so people don't want to believe it. And so there was this split in the community between people saying, yes, I believe you, I'm with you. I've also been damaged by, by this man, by this family, by these events. And then people who are like, no, and we reject you for saying anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. We choose not to believe it. And like, I think to this day, my mother's extended family members are split on on the on the topic. Some of them are just like, yeah, remember all that trouble you guys caused back in the '90s? Like, have you guys gotten over that yet? Wow. Um, and then there are the people who 
you know, or trying to ride the fence and be like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I believe it, but you know, like I just want you guys to be safe and happy. And um, it's in 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 the sort of interpersonal family dynamics too, like the where my aunt was like the the no bullshit. I'm gonna I'm gonna go the straightforward approach and you know record everything and remember everything and like be a bulldog and getting what I need for my children. Um, my mom was the one who said nothing really happened to you, right? Um, and she continually functions on dissociation and denial. And that's been her coping mechanism for her whole life. Um, and she has very, very, very few childhood memories. Um, and it's sort of like she just, I think she just forgets about it, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of nuts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think I think that if she were, if she were to let it all in, it would be overwhelming to the point of complete this, like, disintegration of her sense of like self and stability in the world. Um, but I know she feels it because like now my kids, like my daughter's eight and she walks home from school because we live in a, we're very privileged to live in a very safe neighborhood. And my mom was like, so you know that there's a guy with a van, a white man, and he's, which is apparently like an urban legend that's been circling the internet recently. Um, but you know, she's like, you know, is she aware of stranger danger? And it just gets me because I'm like, the guy in the white van is not the threat. It's your fucking, you know, <laughs> it's, your, it's your father. It's, right. it's your boyfriend. Yeah. It's your, it's the stepdads and the uncles and the cousins. Yeah. And like, nobody wants to acknowledge it's it. It's all the people you don't want. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's all the people that you, that you don't want to acknowledge all the people it's so much easier to just say this can only happen from a only strangers will do this nobody Mm -hmm. wants to come to terms with the fact that it can be people that you love and um almost always is (laughs) yeah yeah it really is and and it's so funny i just i was writing a couple of things down while you were while you were saying all of that because there's so much overlap um between your experience and mine and I think it's just, I think it's just all, I think, I think all abuse stories have some similar elements. Like if you look at, um, like when I, after, after we went to trial, there was, uh, there was this one family cause we were on the same soccer team. And so we had a bunch of mutual friends, uh, me and me and the guy who molested me, his, his son and I were, that's how we ended up getting in touch. Um, and, uh, <laughs> literally, um, Anyway, uh, the uh, he uh, there was this one family who just wanted everybody to just be friends and like act like nothing had happened. Nothing happened. Yeah. yeah, and it's like what the fuck? Like how can you even? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to yeah. them, because we would like we would be at like sporting events together, and they would try to like get us to like sit close and oh, like, geez. and it's like what do you what do you even? And really what it is, is it's their, it's their inability to comprehend and acknowledge what's going on. And yeah. it's always sort of an internal personal thing. Like it sounds like with your mom, not wanting to address yeah. the possibility that yeah. this, that this happened. And it's so much easier. The The phrase that my parents would always use is um, burying your head in the sand and yeah. uh, mm-hmm. just not looking at what is right in front of you. We had this one family that, um, that just kept sending their kids over there. They were like knowing everything. They were just like, yeah. yeah. And and their rationale yeah. for it was um, they didn't want my friend. I've always used his like uh, anonymous name. I call him Jamie uh, and everything. And so they were like, we don't want Jamie to not have friends. And it's like, that's very nice of you. But <laughs> do you also that's want? Jamie over yeah. It? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And there were a lot of families uh, that, that I'm still a lot of my best friends families had that situation they told their kids hey you can have Jamie over whenever you want but you're never going to go over there again and that's like a perfectly reasonable compromise you know and it's too bad that people are Mm -hmm. so set on on not acknowledging this this problem that we're facing as a species I mean this is a this is I'm pretty sure this is unique to humans I was looking this up the other day I don't know if like animals molest other animals because uh animalistically you're not children can't reproduce so animals are not attracted on that level to 
other animals like kids. So I think this is this is a human unique learned behavior, which is really bizarre. But anyway, it's sort of a side yeah. note. Um, another thing that uh, you mentioned uh, that made me think of the Brett Kavanaugh case. Um, this is sort of talking about Me Too related uh -huh. things. Um, the people that were coming to your uh, grandfather's defense saying, look at all the good things he's done. Yeah. Look at yeah. all the things that would have look at all the things that have nothing to do yeah, <laughs> with what we're talking this. about. <laughs> Yeah, but for yeah, some yeah. reason speak to his character. So in the Brett Kavanaugh case, all of the women that came to his defense and were like, he never raped me. Like, as if that's some sort of yeah. a defense. And they did it with Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, yeah. like, I don't know. Did you guys see? Yeah. Sorry? With Mac Macaulay Culkin? Yes, yes. Yeah. And Chappelle talked about that in his newest special. I made a video about that, talking about how Chappelle was like, you know, if, if Michael Jackson was molesting all of these kids, why not Macaulay Culkin? And it's, I mean, it's just the dumbest logic. He would have gotten in trouble for it. Like, yeah, it, well, it's like just because yeah. he didn't molest you doesn't mean that he didn't molest anyone. It, it's just the silliest logic. But it's, it just, sh it goes to show what, how, what people are willing to accept and believe it, in order to not have to come to terms with what's yeah, going on and, and i'm gonna i'm gonna do like a very therapisty thing here um since they work as a therapist but to me it's sort of like yes it's easy to recognize that those those beliefs are fear-based right mm -hmm. um and i think in a lot of ways like it comes down to avoidance of accountability and avoidance of grief because you know you were talking about this is this is not a new thing this is mm -hmm. since, since humans have been around humans have been doing this to each other um and it's traumatic and it's really painful. And I think that um, we have a particular, especially in the last couple, maybe three generations, we have a particularly low tolerance for grief. Um, when you look at the way our culture sanitizes death, when you and distances ourselves from it, when you look at the way that we utilize medical interventions for everything um, and painkillers. And like, we are, we are very uncomfortable with the notion of being either in pain or experiencing loss or sadness. Like we just can't yeah. tolerate it. Um, and so we will give people a pass on accountability because we don't want to feel the grief because when you're faced with the fact that people get hurt and like our most vulnerable population is the one at the highest, like is the only one at risk for child molestation is children. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sort of like barrier that comes up that's saying like, I, I can't tolerate that. Therefore, I don't want to believe it. Therefore, I'm just not going to look at it. That's wild too, because I feel like in terms of social issues, the way to get people to care about anything is with kids. Like the yeah. kids, children, <laughs> yeah. always the way in. It's how you get yeah, best funds. How you get people to stop smoking inside. It's how you get people to stop polluting the air. It's how you like yeah. get people to do pretty much anything yeah. good is being like it's hurting kids. But this one thing for some reason is too hard for everyone. Yeah, to do that with. Yeah, and and I wonder how much of it is because like it's so pervasive that it touches a nerve and like it's our own shit. Like, you know, I think I think yeah. we all either have experienced it or know someone who's experienced it. You know, like the the ACEs, the adverse childhood event. Um have are you aware of this study? No. It it's like one of the single largest administrated administered um uh, surveys, and it's been administrated to tens of thousands of people, um, and it correlates adverse childhood events um, and mental health issues. But some of the interesting, and I should have done some research before this call, but some of the interesting um, results of the study was that almost no one comes away from childhood unscathed, like zero people, zero percent, point zero something percent of people have had no zero to one adverse childhood events and so many like two thirds of people have had at least two or more and you know like it's just it's just crazy um how much we just want to say I, i'm not going there i don't want to think about it and, that, and i think part of it is once we get out of childhood we sort of graduate from this um this belief that we're helpless this, you know, now I'm 18. Now I can, I have all these privileges in society. I can, I can vote, I can drive, I can drink, I can get a job. I have to pay taxes, but I'll, I'll suddenly, I'll take it because I have all of these, you know, I'm, I'm not powerless anymore. 
Um, and so I don't want to look at any situations in my past where I may have been powerless. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I do think maybe, and this could just be just because we were just talking about it, but maybe there is some innate sort of thing where people, even when you are an adult, you never really know if this happened to your yeah. kid. Yeah. So there is that like acknowledging that this does happen. Like, it's just like, well, what, what kind of box could this open? You yeah. Know what I mean? yeah. And I don't think that's a conscious fear, but it might be an unconscious thing. Absolutely. I think, I think you nailed it. It's, it's the pervasiveness of it. It's, it's such a gross thing to think about and, but at the same time, it's it's just not. Nobody wants to believe that another human could do this. Yeah. You know? And yeah. and and at that's it's sort of like facing this really dark side of humanity that, uh, as you said, Annie, like our our current society basically is just like here's all here's a bunch of things that allow you to not deal with the actual problems that you're facing, whether it's uh, booze, you know, smoking, uh, opioids, whatever it is. It's like it, let's all these all these sort of um, external things that could be solved internally uh, if you were willing to look at the reality of of whatever yeah. it is that you've been through. Um, but it's just, it's so much easier for people to, to just in the same way that, you know, friends of, uh, the people that abused us wanted to just not acknowledge this. It's so much easier to just brush it off and, and, and move on with your lives. And nobody wants to feel this way. And I get that. I, I, I honestly empathize a lot with the people that, even though I think they're very silly, uh, I understand why people were so reluctant to believe that the guy who molested me could have done it. And, mm-hmm. and likewise with yeah. your grandfather, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's such a confusing thing to, <laughs> to deal with and process. And I, mm-hmm. I, and even looking at, I mean, it's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. Like it just, if you look at the Catholic church alone, if any, yep. I swear to God, if any other organization had this rate yep. of molestation, <laughs> yeah. imagine if like fucking, I don't know, NASCAR drivers were like all of a sudden just coming out by the thousands with it. It's like for some reason, just because it's a religion, there's there's this, they have like an immunity to it or, or something. I don't know what it is, but it's it's really, it's wild. The Boy Scouts, the Boy Scouts yeah. just got caught for, which, you know, kind of makes sense. Uh, cause I mean, what adult is like, yeah, yeah, no, we just really like tying knots. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If I'm yeah. 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 It, this is the craziest part about all of this is that like all the things that we're talking about are reported cases. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know the number. I mean, I guess it's impossible to know the numbers because they're unreported, but I can imagine that, especially as we were talking about in the society that we're living in, that doesn't want to address things that have happened those numbers are probably way so, crazier than we can even imagine. Yeah. I think it's yeah. one in five kids, one in four girls, one in six boys. So one in five on average of that's reported cases. That's 20% of children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah reported. That's bananas. That's um, wild. Yeah. I know. I know. It's so, oh man, it's such a bummer, <laughs> but it's also like, I mean, I, I, I think that it's weird. Even now this feels, it feels good. Like, it feels yeah. good to just be conversing about it. And I think mm-hmm. that there's just this hurdle. It's, 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 it's just this mental block that if people can get over and understand that the most therapeutic thing is telling the truth and mm-hmm. that we need to breed a culture that encourages people to tell the truth. And I know that when it was happening to me, I felt uh, just so scared of how people would react. And I felt really embarrassed. And I didn't want anybody, I, I just didn't want anybody to be mad at me. And mm-hmm. I think that maybe having, I don't really know, and you, this, this is something we can talk about, is what is the best way to inform kids of, of a way out? Um, because all I knew was a good touch and a bad touch. That's what we had learned. And that's mm-hmm. what my mom ended up asking me. She was like, did this guy, did he do a bad touch? And that was how I said yes. But without that, mm-hmm. I never would have probably said anything. Um, and I probably would have suppressed it and forgotten all about it. Um, but what do you guys think if, 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 if we're just sort of, you know, spitballing here, <laughs> brainstorming, I mean, cause you also don't want to, it's a fine line between educating kids and also like, you know, uh, parents don't want their kids learning about sexual things, uh, mm-hmm. early, which is, I understand that, but it's also like, you kind of have to. 
you kind of have to let them know that these dangers are out there. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I don't know, it's complicated. Yeah, like, I mean, it sounds like your parents at least like, like did, like what you said about your, the questions your mom asked, I think that's like, seems really important. Like, I mean, in terms of just taking at least part of the responsibility off of the kid, of just being like developmentally, it's like, there's never, you can never ask too many specific questions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, um, or yeah, and really never stop doing that. But I mean, you're a parent. Um, I noticed you talk to your kids a lot about physical boundaries and, and yeah. they're, they're like and respecting them and um, and setting them too. Yeah. Um, and that I think seems like a part of it. I I my response to that um, I and and of course like I second guess my approach with my kids all the time because I don't have like a healthy script. Mm -hmm. I have like a broken script that I've had to rewrite through <laughs> therapy and experience. And, you know, like I have, I've, I've, I've um, <laughs> but I think I have a hunch that, that one way, and I'm saying it like that because I'm, I'm having an impulse to say the only way or the best way. And I, I know those aren't um, helpful. But one way to do it, and what we try to use at home, is by modeling. And by model, like my my husband and I modeling appropriate boundaries and modeling and saying like, hey, can I give you a kiss? And like, um, hey, can I have a hug? Um, and and even with my children, I'll ask like my four year old, can I pick you up? And she'll say she'll say not right now, or I'll I'll be holding her, um, tearing her from the car because she doesn't have doesn't have her shoes on and it's forty degrees outside. And then I'm so close and I just love her. And I'll, but I'll ask her like, Hey, can I kiss your cheek? Mm -hmm. And sometimes she'll say, no, damn it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But I'm not going to just, just do it because I think that shows her that like her body is a commodity. Right. Mm -hmm. And that I'm an adult and I get to kiss you when I want. And that's not true. Right. Like I think teaching, teaching kids body autonomy, but not through lecturing or some sort of paradigmatic way of you know don't the sort of like don't let anybody see the, your swimsuit parts but mm -hmm. but sort of like modeling privacy and modeling consent and modeling boundaries and encouraging encouraging my kids to have conversations um like my my oldest is very is very like larger than life, exuberant, huggy, you know, that sort of thing. And my youngest is very sort of like reserved. And so I have to facilitate conversations between them frequently about like, well, why did she get mad at you? Well, she, you weren't using your words. Well, what were your words? Could you have used? And I think like a lot of it comes down to practice, right? Mm -hmm. um, Cause in, even in adulthood, I think that we, I mean, and I'm sure there's like millions of conversations about this, but as women, like we will railroad our own boundaries, mm -hmm. physical boundaries, because the expectation of what someone else desires of us is there. And we'd rather comply or we'd rather just not make a fuss. So um, it's the notion that it will be more uncomfortable to sort of assert that boundary yeah. than to sort of just let it, like just deal with it. Mm. Um, but I think like, uh, my my hunch is that it comes down to very early on giving kids permission to set their own boundaries. Um, so like my oldest will always want to take a bath with my youngest because it's splashy fun water time. And my youngest is like, no, oh, thanks. Like, so that's a little, no, oh, thanks. Um, but then my youngest will always want to take a bath with me. And I'm like, oh, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And just, um, you know, like, modeling that body autonomy and that permission to say no and to, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to do it. No, I think that's that's an amazing idea. And and I think it would sort of trickle into future development that would allow people, as you mentioned, Lauren, to say no in the future and 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 understand yeah. that like this is this is not you should never be afraid of how you'll be perceived for saying no. Um and mm -hmm. I think that that is is so accurate. And I and especially that's exactly how I felt. I felt like it, it was easier to just endure and not mm -hmm. ruin friendships and and not have mm -hmm. to confront this awkwardness. But 
making kids know at, at as early an age as possible and having in parental, uh, uh, what would be the word? Just having your parents show you and demonstrate. That's so, that, that's, that's an amazing idea. I love that. Maybe the best way isn't actually education in schools, but parental education and, and just showing people yeah. that like, this is, I mean, I, I was thinking to myself the other day, cause I, I don't have kids obviously, but I, I was thinking like, I, I feel like I'm going to end up sitting my kids down and just being like, listen, like if anyone ever does anything, like, I feel like you, you can't check in enough, you know, mm-hmm. like you can't ask, like you said, you can never ask too many specifics and, and mm-hmm. just, I mean, I don't know what an appropriate, I mean, just just letting them know that they're safe and that they're okay and that you you don't need to ever fear uh the the fears that we were talking about and and that goes all the way up into adulthood i mean obviously more so for women uh but just just knowing that your feelings are valid and like you're you should never feel ashamed of them and so Go ahead. Yeah, and and I think like the part like the part of that that I'm feeling an urge to respond to is ye, for that to work, you have to be okay with feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to, and like when I was when I was going through sort of like I called it my Z pack of therapy specifically. <laughs> specifically, like, oh girl, I mean I've been in therapy like so many times in my life, and, but like. Most recently, it was about a year specifically addressing, um, like, I came in and I had two therapists at the same time because one was doing EMDR with me, which is great, and another one was doing talk therapy, and I, like, I was just like, I'm going to do the pack and I'm going to hack into this and figure out, like, how, where I need to get so that I can just sort of release a lot of this because it started to get in the way, and I think, like, I came in and I was saying, like, one of my primary concerns was my anxiety was so heightened and like sussing out like like part of my anxiety was heightened because I was having this, this sort of irrational thought of like, what is happening to my daughter's bodies? There's their innocent little girl bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, again, the answer is nothing bad, but I was projecting my shit onto them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I needed to go within and work through my own avoidance of like what happened to my body and the impact of that and all of the fucking feelings yeah. and like I I've never been allowed to feel that like I'll feel angry I'll feel lonely I'll feel angsty I'll feel just sort of depressed but like just sort of like sad in this pure way like when your dog dies and you just piss them yeah. um like I had never let myself feel that way about the shit that I lost, like mm-hmm. that my innocence, my sense of trust in adulthood and right action in the world and justice and, and like feeling sad fucking blows, mm-hmm. like it's the worst, <laughs> but you have to be comfortable with those feelings. And I think that as long as we are, as long as as adults, as parents, as citizens, we're uncomfortable with feeling like that deep sorrow. And we, you know, we have narratives like, wait till you get home to cry. Um, <laughs> or like, you know, crying for sissies. Or, or, or get over it. Get over yeah, it. Just, 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 just suck just, it up. Like, yeah. like, get through. Yeah, bad shit happens to everybody. You're still out about this? Yeah. Or something oh, worse God, happening to someone else. So, like, just don't worry about what's happening to you. And I think until we let ourselves really feel it, then, like, we're never going to have room to let kids feel it and speak their truth because what we're modeling is like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Your, your, your papa never did anything bad to you. Right. Uh, Well, and I think, I think generationally, like regardless of like what your story is, like we're culturally so fucked up about the stuff that it is. It's like learning a foreign language of like doing it the right way. And it's like one of those things where we're like, yeah, you can learn as an adult, but it's really fucking hard. (laughs) Or you can teach it to kids at a really young age and then they have it to sort of like go off of their whole lives and yeah. like most of us didn't learn that foreign language as kids because that's just like our parents didn't really yeah. have those that knowledge or those like that information yeah. you know it's definitely general there's a there's a massive gap i i like to think yeah. that that we're getting better at it i think i think the older generations are a lot more suppressed and then they projected that onto the younger yeah. generations like us absolutely 
but Big allow- boomers are so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. But I and, and like like what you said just about your dog dying. So I moved out. I moved out to to LA to take care of my grandfather and to and to do stand up. Um, and he passed away recently, so um, clearly I didn't do a very good job. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's been like just so like I feel like I also never really allowed myself to feel uh feelings i mean it was the first time somebody that i like really loved died um but it's just wild watching these feelings manifest themselves like i'll be feeling fine and then like the next thing i know i'm just breaking down in trader joe's like just randomly like out of nowhere and it's it what's cool about having talked about the molestation stuff and having started to accept that is that now rather than suppressing those things it feels like I feel more okay just letting them out. And as a result of that, it becomes so much easier to deal with. And it's mm-hmm. like it, the, the the quick solution is just to suppress it. Don't deal with it. Mm-hmm. And then it just mm-hmm. builds up and then it becomes so much worse rather than just, I mean, feelings are like our body's re- natural ability to process the, the horrors of life. Yeah. And yet yeah. we our society is pressuring us to not feel them. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I, what I hope people can kind of get from something like this, a conversation like this. I mean, we are strangers. <laughs> it doesn't feel like that at all now. I feel like I know you yeah. guys now, but it's it's we're strangers that are bonding over abuse. Like that's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> but like it's so cool that this is a thing that you can you can show people that not only should you not be ashamed of what you've gone through, but that it should I, I don't know, celebrated is the right word, but you can turn it into something positive. You can create relationships from this stuff and and have it be a thing that you don't need to don't need to be ashamed of. So this is, have you, it was a, it was like a video that went viral a, a little while ago. Um, the interview between Anderson Cooper and Stephen Colbert. Have you seen that? Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. What happened? Um, I highly recommend it. Um, but Colbert is basically, they're having this conversation um, about grief and about like Colbert's um, dad and brothers died in a plane crash when he was 10 years old. Um, and it was recently after the death of Anderson Cooper's, um, mother. So they're talking about grief and how grief changes you. And obviously Stephen Colbert's grief was a traumatic grief because of his age. Um, and you know, how he coped with that and integrated that experience into his life. But, you know, one of the things, one of like the moments in the interview was when Anderson Cooper sort of like is scanning down like a list of, you know, questions and quotes. And he comes to this one and he says like, you know, you once said like, you know, this thing about finding gratitude for the things we wish never happen. Like mm. you buy that? Is that, a, is that a real thing? And Colbert like talks about it a little bit and he said, it's not actually his quote. It was from Tolkien, but, but yeah, like this, this finding, you use the word celebration, but finding gratitude for the things that like, we wish never happened because of the way that they change us and because of the opportunities that they provide for us to, experience life differently yeah. Uh, yeah to understand these deeper darker true things about human nature that like other people like block out you know absolutely that's pretty that's super profound i'm definitely yeah. gonna watch that yeah. acceptance of, of of things like that is so it's so important and uh, I don't know, like it just, it just, it just feels good talking about feelings. Like it just feels good to talk about this. And and mm-hmm. it's it's so unfortunate that most people never do. I think the average age of uh, uh, telling people that you got uh, abused is forty six. Mm-hmm. Wow, what a <laughs> horrible way to go about life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, living with that. That's yeah. Yeah, unfortunate. It is unfortunate. And I just to not to just change gears a little bit here, but um, Lauren, I wanted to ask you a little bit about comedy and uh, just like what, yeah. what got you into it. And uh, I know uh, Annie had mentioned that you you talk a lot about Me Too and, and things related to that. And I just love to hear about uh, your story. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I've been doing stand up probably on offer about like nine or 10 years. I, I do like, I, I mean, sometimes I, like, qualify it, like, more of, like, oh, I'm, but I'm more of a writer, but I do perform regularly, and I love it. Like, I'm, I'm never probably going to stop doing it. Um, it's, like, a part of me. 
But, I mean, I do feel like a lot of, um, yeah, like, early on, like, um, my standard has gone through different sort of deeply personal iterations and then, like, no me at all in it whatsoever. And um, it's, like, always interesting the ebbs and flows. So, like, right now, I mean, I talk a lot about relationships. I talk a lot about, I, I would, right now, like, my act is very similar and my approach to stand-up is very similar to my approach to writing. And I've been writing about men and relationships, not necessarily the relationships I have with men. Sometimes it's that. But just, um, why like men are fascinating to me because they're different than women mm -hmm. and it's like all like in the sort of like the whole ma like masculinity stuff and figuring out what's good about it and what's bad about it is very a part of the media right now and uh, there's just a ton of stuff happening like in the psych sort of space so a lot of my writing is a lot sort of around that and i don't know i mean i think like so my stand-up right now is, like, a lot of, like, about men, but it's not, like, shitting on them. I try to, like, it's, like, and, and about, like, it. it's almost, like, I feel like I've gone, like, full, like, 80s hack, where it is, like, a lot of, like, I feel like it's a lot of, like, a new sort of men and women are different. But, um, but yeah, I'm sort of, I've become really empathetic. I, I've had, a, I've developed a new sort of empathy for men, um, over the past few years, the more I've, like, written about them, and I think that's coming out a lot more in my stand-up now of just, you know, like, I I have a joke about how, uh, it's just such a silly joke, but about how I feel bad for white guys, like, right after they get haircuts, because you all, like, look like little boys right <laughs> afterwards, and, but, like, no the way into that, like, it, that. like, sort of talking <laughs> about how it's, like, we're in this, like, place right now where we can't feel bad for white guys about anything people hate it when you do it <laughs> and it's just like I I feel bad for you guys and it's like the thing people le like least about me you know what I mean? and then I talk about the haircut thing I'm like we can all feel bad for them about this it's like silly <laughs> right. and whatever right. but yeah I, I I'm trying to sort of um and this has happened a lot with my writing too uh, make men which creates space for men to have conversations that they haven't always been willing to have. Um, and, and not really be like, put them on the defense, but just like, be like, be like, no, this is safe. Like, I'm not gonna, you know, um, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong or that you're bad, but I really like, we're both different and I want to understand each other kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's like where my writing and my standup has gone in the past, like two, three years. Um, and I obviously write, write about women, but I am fascinated by men. Um, I think I want to call, I want to jump in because I used to go to a lot of Lauren's shows um, in Chicago when we lived in the early days. Too. In the early days yeah. um, when we lived there together. But I think like you've always had an appreciation for comedy being a vehicle for things that you can't say somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you can say them honestly and you can say them in a tongue in cheek way or you can say them just in sort of like a bald face like it's out here kind of way, but in other media, it would be considered, you, you would just have to do so much mm -hmm. talking around the issue and so many, like, yeah. you'd have to pad it with so much um, uh, contextualization and so many qualifications of, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this, but what I really want to talk about is this tiny little, and in comedy, you're just like, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> yeah, and, like, and being able to, like, I do, like, it's hard, but I do like the challenge of when you do decide to talk about something difficult of uh, making, and I, I failed at this a ton of times, but what I really would impress me about your stand-up was that, like, you're talking about something that's hard in a lighthearted way, in, but the way you're talking about it, you really get a sense as an audience member that you're okay. Yeah. And I've been I've been that person like on stage going through a breakup, like talking about a relationship where it's like it's not even that the things I'm saying aren't funny, but the people on some level in my audience can tell that I'm not okay with talking about this yet. Mm -hmm. And it's just no matter how funny, there's no joke funnier enough to make people comfortable with just like what uh, what you're putting out there existentially in those situations. Um, so it's like, you do have to do that self-work to talk about certain things, which I think I've learned very much the long and hard way in comedy. Um, and I'm still learning, you know what I mean? Like, I still have things where I'm like, oop, nope, not yet, nope. Um, and things where I'm like, I, things that happened to me years ago that I tried to talk on stage about 
that I can talk about now and it's very light and funny, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. it is, um, comedy does really hold you accountable for dealing with some shit if you want to talk about it because your audience has, will call you on it if, if someone in your real life doesn't. Like, totally. without, yeah, you know? Yeah. I know exactly what you mean about the audience knowing and feeling that you're not okay. Yeah. Um, especially when I was starting, uh, cause I had a good first set. I did it at the stand in, in New York city before it, <laughs> it reopened, but, uh, before it, before it moved, um, I did it there and I said it was my first time. So like, of course, once you say that, everybody's like, yeah, like it's everybody yeah. becomes super supportive. Um, mm -hmm. but for uh, probably three months after that, it was just bombing, just tanking yeah. over and over and over because you don't know how to introduce the material especially like molestation and just it's so palpable when you're mm -hmm. not okay and you might yeah. not realize that as a performer but as an audience member like I did uh I did that set uh that same molestation set uh recently at a show and it was like right around the time when my grandpa died and I was super stressed out and I was like <laughs> moving and there were just all of these factors that went into it. And my delivery was completely off. And it, it was like, it was like a whole different, it didn't, it didn't do, I mean, it's, it was okay, but it was nowhere yeah. near the level of, of, of laughter that the recording had. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's that, it's such a weird thing that the audience can sense, but they just know. And it's, yeah. it's, but it is cool, like you said, because they'll call you on it. It's like, it's them telling you, hey, you're not ready. You're not done yet processing this. Or, I mean, clearly you're working through it. And it's such a. It's such an interesting relationship that you have as a performer between yourself and the audience. And uh, it really oh, is a wake-up call. It Go ahead. sucks so much. It can feel so bad, but it is yeah. such important, helpful feedback once you, like, separate from the, like, oh, I bombed, or, oh, that didn't yeah. feel good, or, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as good as it feels, like, I, I like to think that, like, when you have a good show, like, there's really no feeling like that. But yeah. it's as bad when you bomb as it is good. It's the, the exact same level of, of disappointment and excitement. And you're never going to not bomb. No, no. one's, uh, no one's bomb-proof. That's, that's my favorite thing about comedy. Yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's, it's cool also, like, I, I think one of the things that you said that struck me was um, how your uh, criticisms of men have turned into empathy. I think that yeah. that's a really cool transition that I think a lot of people make, but not a lot of people don't get to that point. A lot of people stay stuck in the criticism phase. And cause I, I do a lot. I talk a lot about women and, and dating and, and uh, yeah. the experiences that I've had too. And while they're probably very different, it ends up ultimately being, I I feel more empathetic to women now where it's like, one of the things that I talk about is like a, a lot of girls will want to be dating before doing anything physical and it's different mm -hmm. between guys and girls and where initially it was like oh come on like why not like you end mm -hmm. up being like oh this totally makes sense based on past experiences that you've had why you wouldn't want to just jump into this I completely yep. and you develop that empathy over what becomes initially or what is initially criticism like this one girl um we'd been on three dates and uh she came back to my place and she like made it open she was like hey i don't think we should have sex and i was like okay like that's cool like uh also just out of curiosity why <laughs> not like yeah. come on let's do it but just what what is it that that you think uh wh what's your thought process and she yeah. was like well honestly in the past whenever i sleep with a guy it ends up i just don't see them again it just seems like all guys are rushing towards sex and then once it happens that it, it, then it's sort of over and mm -hmm. what I said is I was like, yeah, but like, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm not like the other guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and she was like, that's literally what all guys would say. And I was like, oh, you're totally hundred <laughs> percent right about that. Um, but then, and so that was like a funny, it was actually ended up being a very funny, honest exchange between the two of us where it wasn't either of us trying to convince the other one. It was just trying to understand the other person's perspective. And okay. the point that I made to her was that I also completely understand where you're coming from. But you waiting longer to have sex with me doesn't increase the chances that I <laughs> see you again, which is also yeah. an interesting thing. Because for guys, I think it's sort of like, 
it's if if you're not compatible sexually then it's it's you want to know you kind of want to know but it's also after talking to her i'm like i completely get why this is not something that you want to just rush into if people have just been leaving immediately after like that's super disheartening so just yeah. being able to have open honest conversations with the other gender is is it's fun it's really fun and it's interesting and if you can do it in a non-judgmental way I mean that's and this goes back all the way back to abuse being able to talk about things openly without any sort of repression of feelings or 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 why you feel those feelings i'm i'm just really thankful that that you guys were open to to chatting and uh i i i'm also feeling really grateful i think what you're doing is really cool and i can see how like as part of your own healing journey and like sharing that with others like gives other people the courage to, to do the same thing um and i i really admire that um thank you and and i would i would be pleased to to be a part of, you know, whatever else. Like, I don't have any social media because, and I, I mentioned this on on our sort of Reddit chat, is like, I, I'm very, I realized as an adult, I'm very sensitive to influence. Um, and so like part of, part of my, <laughs> part of my self-care, part of taking just care of myself on the every, on the, on the daily is like, I can't, I can't subject myself to TV news. Um, I have to be careful with what I, what news I read because it's all fucking just like a downer. Yeah. I can't do Facebook. I can't do Instagram because I get caught up in these these mental gymnastics about like what are they doing and all all of all of the research that's been done about how it's bad for your mental health and all of that. Um, but I think it's I think it's really cool that the Reddit was this medium that sort of worked for um to bring us together at this point and i would love to be a part of something in the future i don't know what that looks like but i, I sure. don't know what it'll look like either i'm still trying to figure all of this out as i go but i would absolutely love both of you to 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 be a part of it it means so much that you guys were willing to to talk about your stories and and uh it's i think it'll be really encouraging for for people listening to to hear as well and um yeah. and it's Great. just it's it's so it's also just on a personal level to hear so many of the similarities between our stories, Annie, it makes mm. it feel less isolated and yeah. Uh, yeah. makes you feel more yeah. comfortable with everything that happened. So yeah. I hope yeah, that sure. other people get similar benefits. And um, yeah, yeah and, unless there's anything else, I, I, it was just such a pleasure talking to you two. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is great. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks so much. And um, yeah, this has been episode three of What Happened to You. We'll talk yeah. to you soon. Take care. <laughs>